Sandman Volume 9, The Kindly Ones, written by Neil Gaiman, art by Mark Hempel, Richard Case, D. Israel, Teddy Christensen, Glenn Dillon, Charles Vess, Dean Ormston, and Kevin Nolan. All right, Volume 9, The Kindly Ones. Now, I was a little bit down on Volume 8. It's actually my least favorite volume of Sandman, but Volume 9 is excellent. It is a very important plot-driven volume. So much stuff goes down, and it's very exciting, so I think you will all dig it. Before I dive into the story, though, I just want to comment on the artwork in this volume. Previous volumes of Sandman have had very beautiful, detailed artwork. Whereas this volume, The Kindly Ones, the artwork is kind of blocky and expressionist and very kind of cartoony, and I don't think it is everyone's cup of tea. In the Sandman companion book, Neil Gaiman actually comments that when Sandman was coming out at the time, a lot of people didn't dig the artwork in this particular story arc. Neil says that this volume is about shadows, shapes, form, and fire. I wanted someone with a simple, lucid style. I knew the cartoony quality of the art would alienate some readers, but I knew in the next volume, The Wake, the artwork would be illustrated by Michael Azuli, who would draw everything so realistically, you'd think he was actually there sketching it in person as it happened. So, the artwork in this volume, a little bit cartoony and basic, but that is done on purpose. But next volume, the artwork's going to be so nice. So, uh... If you're grumpy about it, it'll be great next volume. All right, let's dive into it. Volume 9, The Kindly Ones. Issue 57, The Kindly Ones, Part 1. The three witches, otherwise known as The Kindly Ones, or Cynthia, Mildred, and Morgan, they are all drinking tea while talking about their duties, and they read a fortune cookie that says, A king will forsake his kingdom. Life and death will clash and fray. The oldest battle begins once more. Lita Hall is living in Los Angeles, and she is taking care of her son, Daniel Hall. Her friend, Carla, is helping her. The two of them take Daniel for some ice cream. Lita Hall and Carla discuss Lita's potential job offer she has, although she is hesitant to take it because she doesn't want anything bad to happen to Daniel if she is away from him. Matthew is flying around the dreaming. He is looking for Morpheus. Matthew talks with the Griffin, Wyvern, and Hippogriff guarding the front of Morpheus's castle. He then talks with Mervyn Pumpkinhead, who is complaining about various work he has to do around the dreaming. Matthew then talks with Nuala, who is cleaning. And then Matthew talks with Lucian, who is reading. Matthew used to be a human before he died and he has been a raven for five years or so now. And he is concerned about what's going to happen to him. He knows that he is not Morpheus' first raven, and he might not be his last. Lucian doesn't have any answers for Matthew, though. Matthew finally tracks Morpheus down. Morpheus is rebuilding a new version of the Corinthian. This version of the Corinthian will not exactly be like the last one, but it will have a fragment of the old Corinthian in him, and some of the old Corinthian's memories, but not all. Matthew doesn't like the Corinthian, and tells Morpheus he shouldn't be remaking him, especially after what the last one did. Morpheus answers that the last Corinthian was a fool. This one will not be. As a reader, we will not really know if this new Corinthian can be fully trusted or not. Will he turn evil again and betray Morpheus, or will he serve Morpheus faithfully? That unknown kind of makes him a fun character to have now. Matthew asks about Morpheus' past ravens. Apparently Morpheus has had 11 or 12 previous ravens. One of them even got turned back into a man at one point, although that raven thought that was what it wanted at the time, but it didn't last, or so Morpheus says. Matthew wants to know what happens to the ravens when they are not in the dreaming anymore. Matthew says he asked Eve, but she wouldn't tell him. Morpheus says that that is as it should be, Matthew. Matthew pushes for answers from Morpheus, though. But Morpheus sends Matthew away, back to Eve's cave. Back to Los Angeles. 
Lita Hall shows up at the Lux Piano Bar. This is the bar that Lucifer has been running since he left hell. This is how he spends his time now, running this nightclub playing piano. Lucifer's consort, Mazakin, also works as a waitress in the bar. You might remember Mazakin from Volume 4. Her and Lucifer were making out, and she was missing half of her face and couldn't talk clearly. Well, she now works in the Lux by Lucifer's side, and she wears something that covers the messed up side of her face. Lita Hall meets with her potential employer named Eric Needham in the Lux Bar. He wants Lita because she is beautiful and strong and because of her superhero past, and he makes her a very generous job offer. She can pick her own salary and she will have lots of cool responsibilities. Lita is skeptical though because she doesn't want to be away from her son Daniel for very long periods of time. She almost never leaves his side. Tonight, she has a babysitter, though. After a while, Lita feels that something is wrong with her son Daniel. She just senses it, and she is worried. She gets Eric to drive her back to her home, and when Lita arrives at her house, she enters and realizes that her son Daniel has gone missing. Issue 58, The Kindly Ones, Part 2 we find this out later in the story, but I think it's just easier for all of our understanding to reveal this to you now. The tricksters, Loki of the Norse gods and Robin Goodfellow, or Puck, of the fairy people, have teamed up, and they are the ones that have taken Daniel Hall. Loki did this because he wishes to destroy Morpheus. If you remember in Volume 4, Morpheus saved Loki from his fate of returning to Asgard and being trapped and having acid drip on his face for all eternity from this snake. Well, in return for saving Loki, Morpheus wanted Loki in his debt to potentially repay a favor at some point in the future. Well, Loki hates being in people's debts. He hates it so much he would rather scheme and try and destroy Morpheus than stay under his debt. This is why you never make a deal with a trickster god. Puck, meanwhile, his motivations for kidnapping Daniel Hall is purely driven by his desire for mischief, nothing more. He also likes hanging out with Loki. Lita and Carla are in Lita's apartment, and they are frantic over Daniel missing. They phone the police, and some officers finally arrive to ask some questions and investigate. The police officers that arrive are secretly Loki and Puck in disguise. They intercepted the police call and are trying to avoid Lita actually getting the real police involved. Loki says his name is Lieutenant Luke Pinkerton, and his partner is Gordy Fellows. They ask some questions and put up the facade that they are real police officers. We find out that the babysitter that was looking after Daniel is Rose Walker, who we know as the Dream Vortex from Volume 2 of Sandman. While she has gone back home right now, she lives below Lita in this apartment complex. Well, Rose, she was asleep when Lita arrived home. It was like she was passed out and Lita and Rose can't explain why. We can assume that Loki and Puck hit her with some sort of dream sand or something to knock her out and make her sleep while they stole Daniel. Loki and Puck ask a few more questions and then they finish out their charade and they leave. Loki gives Carla his business card and tells them they'll phone them if they get a break in the case or something. In the dreaming, the fairy Chloricon has arrived at Morpheus's dream castle. He is here to retrieve his sister Nuala and talk with Morpheus. Chloricon is told by the gatekeepers that he can enter, but he should not stray from the path inside as it is not safe for him. Chloricon, he enters the castle and walks. And I gotta explain what happens here because it is a little bit confusing and weird. So Chloricon, he does stray from the path in the dream castle and Chloricon gazes into the mirror, and it first shows him his own reflection, and then it shows him an image of sort of something that looks like Morpheus, who is childish and silly looking. 
The Morpheus figure in the mirror smiles and then transforms into a cat and then departs. The mirror, it somehow sparks the formation of Pluricon's own nemesis within him. A nemesis is defined as the inescapable agent of someone or something's downfall. A nemesis is also a goddess, a spirit of divine retribution against those who succumb to hubris, defined specifically as arrogance before the gods. So somehow, by Cluricon, looking at this mirror in the dream castle off of the path, he has vomited out and created his own nemesis in the form of this weird-looking creature. This indicates that the mirror itself is a mirror of nemesis, one of the odd magics of the palace of the dreaming. Eventually, Nuala, she heard that her brother came for him and she goes and finds him. Nuala saves her brother Cluricon from his certain death from this nemesis, and this nemesis then disappears and runs off. Nuala yells at her brother for straying from the path. Nuala takes Cluricon to her quarters, which she was allowed to create and design herself in Morpheus's castle. She asks Cluricon why he's here, and Cluricon tells her that it is time for her to return home. Cluricon, he is smiling about the news of his sister returning. But Nuala, she actually seems a little bit saddened. She kind of likes it here in the dreaming. Cluricon wants Nuala to take him to Morpheus so he can discuss with Morpheus taking Nuala back to Fairy. Back in Lita Hall's home, she wakes up screaming and Carla runs over to her in the middle of the night. Lita was having a bad dream. She explains that in her dream, she talked to these three witches, and they told her that she already met Daniel's kidnapper. And the kidnapper is going to put Daniel in a fire. Back in the dreaming, Cluricon and Nuala talk with Morpheus in his quarters. Cluricon mentions that his nemesis has been freed in the castle, and if Morpheus can, you know, take care of it, Morpheus says he cannot, it is no longer in the dreaming and it is not his to destroy. Cluricon, he moves on and asks if he can take his sister, Nuala, back with him to Fairy. Morpheus asks, what does Nuala say about all this? Now Nuala, she secretly loves Morpheus. She's been in the dreaming for a few years now, and that love has grown over time. Morpheus is unaware of this, though. Nuala expects Morpheus to not let her leave. She answers, You have been very kind to me, sir, for the last three years. I am yours. What you wish is also what I wish. Morpheus says, Very well. Nuala, you can return home. You are free to take anything with you. Nuala is a little bit devastated. She thought that Morpheus cared for her deeply and would refuse to part with her, and she's disappointed that he so quickly said that she could leave. Now, Nuala, she's wearing a pendant. And Morpheus, he touches the pendant and enchants it. And he tells Nuala, there, for your service, a gift. If in need, hold the stone with both hands and call me, and I will come to you, and you may have one boon. Morpheus says farewell to Nuala. Nuala is a little saddened, but she says thank you. Pluricon and her head off, and Nuala starts crying. Issue 59, The Kindly Ones Part Loki and Puck are talking by a fire. Loki tells Puck of a time he messed with his dumb brother Thor. He made Thor think that he was pregnant. And while Thor was sick thinking that he was pregnant, Loki had sex with his wife. Puck laughs at Loki's story. Little Daniel Hall wanders into the room that they are in and they place him into the fire. Putting someone in a fire is supposedly a method of the gods for burning off a human's mortality. So they are slowly trying to kill Daniel in this fire, but it will take a while, as Daniel is somewhat powerful because he was gestated in the dreaming. We see Hob Gadling. He is in a snowy cemetery, visiting one of his old girlfriends, Audrey, who got killed recently by being hit by a car. Hob is crying. He has lived for so long, and he has had many wives and children, and they all eventually die. It never gets any easier. As Hob leaves the cemetery, Morpheus is there to greet him. 
This isn't one of their normal hundred year meetups. Morpheus just wanted to talk. They go to a nearby bar, and Hob talks about his love that just died, Audrey. He asks Morpheus if he can maybe do something about it with his magic powers. You know, bring her back to life, maybe? Morpheus says he cannot do this. Hob asks, what can he do then? Morpheus says that he could make it so that Hob could dream of her every night. But Hob, he doesn't want that. Could make him really sad after a while. Hob asks if Morpheus can maybe kill the guy that hit and ran her with his van? And teach him a lesson or something? Morpheus advises Hob against revenge, though. And Hob replies, well, I suppose I just want him to know who he killed. What Audrey meant to me. Why she was a good person. And why she made me happy when she smiled. Morpheus, he will do that for Hob. Morpheus says he should not have came here and he leaves the bar. Hob runs after him though. Hob, he tells Morpheus that he stinks of death. It's a smell that Hob recognizes and he tells Morpheus to take care of himself. He's worried about him. Morpheus says, thank you Hob, I shall. Morpheus then disappears away. Lita Hall, with her son Daniel missing, starts having a nervous breakdown of sorts. Her and Carla have a fight and Carla leaves. Eventually, the police officers that are Loki and Puck show up at Lita's door and tell her that her son Daniel is dead. They found his dead body badly burned and they show Lita a photograph of the boy. Lita tells them to leave and Lita, she thinks on her past and she blames Morpheus for Daniel's death. Morpheus killed her husband Hector. Morpheus said he would return and take her child one day. She assumes that Morpheus is responsible for Daniel's death, and she wants to kill Morpheus because of it. Issue 60, The Kindly Ones, Part 4 The angel Remiel, who now co-rules hell with Duma, arrives at the Lux piano bar. Mazakin invites him in, and Remiel talks with Lucifer. Remiel asks if Lucifer ever thought about returning to hell and taking it over once again. Lucifer laughs in Remiel's face. Lucifer knows Remiel just wants to go back up to heaven and is tired of ruling hell. Lucifer says he is not returning to hell. Been there, done that. Lucifer tells Remiel he doesn't like him very much. Ramiel has no backbone, no conviction. Ramiel spits in Lucifer's face. And Lucifer tells Ramiel that when he gave up hell, he gave up none of his powers. And he could easily destroy Ramiel if he wanted to. He chooses not to destroy him though. Lucifer sits down and plays on his piano and tells Ramiel he will talk with him no further. Remiel returns to hell to talk with the angel Duma, and he shares how angry Lucifer made him, and that the meeting with him was an utter failure. Remiel also says, We didn't even begin to talk about the Dream King situation. I was so angry with him. So clearly, even the angels in hell know that something is happening with Morpheus. Lita Hall, having a little nervous breakdown, wants to kill Morpheus. To do so, she seeks the three witches, or the kindly ones. Lita is traveling and wandering the city streets simultaneously as she wanders through the world of myth. You can see in this image here, on the left is the world of myth, and on the right is the city streets. So for the next little while, Lita will be wandering through both worlds at the same time. She is wandering around seeking revenge for her son that she believes is dead. As she is traveling, she runs into some strange travelers. One is a woman whose true love is imprisoned in a high tower. Lita then runs into some sort of cyclops monster, as well as a mysterious catwoman monster. But Lita wanders on, and neither of them can help her. Carla, Lita's friend, goes and knocks on Rose Walker's door. Rose lives downstairs from Lita. Rose apparently has tons of money now from her grandmother Unity Kincaid dying, so she doesn't really have to work right now. Carla asks Rose if she's seen Lita. Rose has not, though. Carla tells Rose to let her know if she finds Lita, 
or if the police come by. Lita Hall eventually stumbles across the Gorgons, Uriel, and Stethano. They are the two immortal sisters of Medusa. You might know Medusa from Greek mythology. Medusa is the woman with snakes for her hair, and if you look into her eyes, you turn to stone. Well, Medusa is dead now, as she has been dead for a while, but her sisters live on. Uriel and Stethano ask Lita if Lita wants to be their new sister. Lita says no, though. Lita explains she is looking for the kindly ones. Lita is also a little bit hungry. The two sisters offer Lita to go down to the garden and eat an apple. So Lita, she walks down to the garden, and there she has a conversation with a creature named Garyon, who is a sort of snake-looking creature with three heads. He is another creature from Greek mythology. Garyon is the grandson of Medusa. Lita and this Garyon talk. He warns her to maybe not eat the apple. He tells her that the ladies who sent her here, Uriel and Stethano, well, they really miss their sister if you get his drift. Lita, she ignores this kind of obtuse warning and she eats the golden apple anyway. We see in the city streets world that she is simultaneously eating an apple there as well, except the apple is all discolored and rotten looking. Morpheus, in his dream realm, goes into his chest to grab two little remnants he saved of the old Corinthian. These two little skulls. Also in the chest, we see Azizel, still trapped in the glass jar there, from when Morpheus confined him in that jar in Volume 4 when they battled. We see Mervyn Pumpkinhead doing some construction work elsewhere in the Dreaming. He's moving a volcano or something. He is talking to another co-worker in the Dreaming named Abuda. The two of them discuss how Nuala got sent home recently. Lucian joins them as well, and Mervyn, he complains per usual about all the stuff that Morpheus has him doing. He starts talking a little shit about Morpheus, but Morpheus then shows up behind him and startles him. Mervyn, he leaves kind of embarrassed and pretends that he wasn't saying anything bad at all. <laughs> Morpheus, he puts the final touches on the new Corinthian that he was making. He inserts the little skulls into the Corinthian's eyes. And with that, he is done. Corinthian 2 is born. Issue 61, The Kindly Ones, Part 5 Lita Hall fell asleep after eating the apple, and when she wakes up, the Gorgons, Uriel, and Stethano are watching over her, and they tell Lita, Good morning, Sister Lita. Did you sleep well? And Lita responds, I'm not your sister. They tell her that she can be if she likes. A snake starts growing in Lita's hair, just like Medusa had. Lita doesn't want to stay, though, and she still wants to get her revenge on Morpheus for supposedly killing Daniel. So she leaves. Rose Walker goes to the hospice center to visit one of her friends, Zelda. Zelda was from Volume 2, The Doll's House. She was one of the roommates in the house that Rose was renting in that volume. Zelda's lesbian lover, Chantel, has passed away, and Zelda herself is dying from AIDS. She did not get AIDS from promiscuous sex, though, but rather just a kidney transplant where the donor happened to have AIDS and it wasn't caught. Rose, she is paying all of Zelda's medical bills. Zelda has no one else in her life. Zelda tells Rose that Rose's grandmother gave her a message in her dream to give to Rose. The message was for Rose to go back to where she lived, where the grandmother lived where she used to sleep. She said, if you go back to her, she'll give you back your heart. In Volume 2, The Doll's House, Rose in the Dreaming gave Unity Kincaid her heart. There is no way Zelda would know that, unless Unity Kincaid was somehow actually talking to her in her dream. In the Dreaming now, with the Corinthian 2 now alive, Morpheus gives Corinthian a job to do. He is to go and find Daniel Hall and return him to the Dreaming, to the castle. Morpheus also wants Matthew the Raven to help the Corinthian on the journey. 
Matthew initially refuses. Corinthian creeps him out, and he doesn't trust him. But Matthew doesn't have much of a choice in the matter. Nuala has returned to the land of fairy, and she has her glamour back on. That makes her beautiful and hides her homely appearance. Queen Titania is talking with Nuala, and she asks if Morpheus ever talked about her. Nuala says no. Queen Titania then asks if Morpheus had any messages that she was to relay to her, and Nuala to this says no. Titania grows bored of Nuala and leaves. Carla, Lita's friend, goes to the police precinct. She talks to the police there about Daniel Hall missing and Lita, and about the other cops that came to visit them recently. The cop there at the police precinct knows nothing of these other cops because, of course, Loki and Puck were just pretending to be cops. The police officer there says he'll make some inquiries. Carla, she pulls out the business card that Loki gave her, but it is now blank. The ink on it vanished. When Carla returns to her apartment later that night, she looks at the picture of the supposedly burned body of Daniel Hall, but the picture becomes unburned, and then Daniel Hall in the picture says, Carla, and then the picture spontaneously combusts into flames. Carla gets, rightfully so, a little bit freaked out by this. She thinks that was weird. Carla goes and talks with Rose Walker a bit. She asks Rose for her help in figuring out all the weird things that have been happening lately. Rose explains that she is going to England for the next few days, so it may have to wait. Rose is going to England to investigate this cryptic message her grandmother sent her from beyond the grave through this Zelda woman. Later that evening, Carla goes outside, and there Loki is dressed as the cop, Luke Pinkerton. Loki points a gun on Carla, and Loki, he feels Carla is asking too many questions. So, he makes her walk over to a nearby car, makes her get in, and then he lights the car aflame and Carla burns to death. Issue 62, The Kindly Ones, Part 6 Rose Walker arrives in England. At the airport, her chauffeur is a man named Jack Holdaway. Jack is the nephew of the previous Jack Holdaway that we met in Volume 2, who has since passed away. Jack drives Rose to the nursing home where Unity Kincaid spent most of her life, sleeping while others took care of her. In the nursing home, Rose is introduced to Paul McGuire. Paul was the gay lover of Alex Burgess. We met him in Volume 1, and he runs this nursing home now. Paul shakes Rose's hand, and Paul tells Rose to feel free to look around as much as she wants. Rose tells Jack to give her three hours to look around the nursing home, and then he can come by and pick her up. So Rose, she asks a nurse in the nursing home to take her to the room where her grandmother, Unity Kincaid, spent most of her time sleeping. Rose, she looks around her grandmother's old room, but doesn't find much of anything. An old lady guest in the nursing home runs into Rose and invites Rose to join her and some friends in the day room to talk. So Rose goes with the old woman. In the day room, there are two other old ladies there. So there are three of them total. These old ladies are perhaps the kindly ones, the witches. They talk with Rose and share some messed up fairy tale type stories with her. Rose eventually leaves them and goes to talk with Paul McGuire some more. Paul wishes to show Rose something. He gets her to follow him. Paul brings Rose to her room where we see Alex Burgess is sleeping. You may remember Alex Burgess from Volume 1. He was the son of Roderick Burgess, the one that trapped Morpheus for all those many years. Well, Morpheus, as revenge for being locked up for so long, made Alex Burgess suffer from something called Eternal Waking. So Alex has been sleeping ever since then for five years now, never waking up. He would always wake up in his dream and then be stuck in another dream and they would always be terrible and scary. Rose, she tells Paul that 
Maybe Alex will wake up one day from this predicament like her grandmother did. Rose's ride, Jack Haldaway, has come to pick her up at the nursing home. Rose, she says bye to Paul. Paul invites her to come up to the gatehouse one day while she's in England. He even offers to show her around the main manor. Rose thanks him and gives Paul his grandmother's ring for good luck. Maybe it will help Alex wake up. Rose leaves and Paul continues to sit by Alex's bedside, wishing that Alex would wake up once again. Issue 63, The Kindly Ones, Part 7 Thessaly, the witch whom we met in Volume 5, arrives in the seedy part of the city, where the homeless people live. She finds Lita Hall there, all disoriented and a little out of her mind, and Thessaly brings Lita back to her car and then drives her to safety. In the dreaming, Odin of Asgard arrives. Odin has figured out that the supposed Loki in Asgard being tortured with acid dripping on his face was just a dream projection, and he is wise to Morpheus's ruse. Odin asks Morpheus if he was responsible for this trickery, and Morpheus admits that he was. Odin is a little angry, but he doesn't hold a grudge against Morpheus. Odin says, Were I to declare a blood feud with every being ever fooled by Loki, I could begin by killing myself. Odin, he leaves Morpheus, but he does say that he is disappointed in Morpheus for deceiving him and being tricked by Loki. We see Delirium, her dog Barnabas is missing. Barnabas is the talking dog that Destruction gave her in Volume 7. Delirium is talking to Destiny about it. Delirium notices that Dream's statue in Destiny's garden is covering his face. Delirium thinks that that's a little bit odd, that maybe Dream is sad and she can cheer him up. Also, she's hoping to maybe go on another adventure with Morpheus and look for her dog Barnabas together. Destiny tells Delirium that the choice is hers, but he suggests that she let Morpheus cope with his own problems. Thessaly brings Lita Hall back with her to her home. She then brings Lita to her bed, and then Thessaly begins doing some weird witch ritual stuff with some chemicals and the blood of a lamb which she has sacrificed. Thessaly then, with the bowl with the blood and all the chemicals, she draws a circle on the floor around the bed. This will protect Lita Hall. This circle or ring of protection is very similar to the one that was used against Morpheus when he was trapped in Volume 1. So Thessaly, she has finished this circle, and she sits down and reads and lets Lita do her thing on the bed. So Lita in the waking world is on that bed in Thessaly's apartment with the ring of protection around her. But Lita's consciousness goes into the dreaming now or into the world of myth. And Lita, she climbs a mountain and she wanders and she eventually finds and talks with the three witches or the kindly ones as they are sometimes known by. Lita tells them that she wants Morpheus dead because she believes that Morpheus killed her son. The kindly ones, they cannot kill Morpheus for killing Lita's son, because it is not of his blood. But the kindly ones are allowed to kill Morpheus for killing his own son, Orpheus, because they are allowed to avenge blood debts, and Orpheus is of Morpheus's blood. It's all due to ancient rules and whatnot. They are allowed to hound Morpheus and destroy his life and his world and hound him into the grave and beyond. The kindly ones offer Lita vengeance on Morpheus if she agrees to be their instrument of destruction. Lita agrees and the kindly ones kind of join forces with her and form into her and the destruction of the dreaming can now begin. Issue 64, The Kindly Ones, Part 8 Morpheus, he goes to various parts of his dream realm, carrying out his various duties. 
He is making sure everything is running smoothly, visiting his various staff and hearing their grievances and acknowledging their service. Eventually, Delirium arrives in the Dreaming and she talks with her brother. She wants him to join her and help her find her doggy, Barnabas. Morpheus tells her that he can't leave his realm right now. He has responsibilities, he has too much to do. Morpheus, he has conscripted one of his nightmare creatures to help his sister find her dog companion, and he sends both Delirium and this nightmare creature both on their way. Meanwhile, over in England, Rose Walker was getting friendly with her driver, Jack Holdaway. She flirts with him, she kind of seduces him, and comes on to him very strong. Jack resists at first, but Rose, she is being really forward, and tells him to come to her hotel room later and bring some condoms and he'll get lucky. Jack, he eventually takes her up on her offer, and they have sex. Jack, he's clumsy and awkward in bed, but Rose shows him a good time, and she really grows to like him. Elsewhere, Corinthian and Matthew the Raven are carrying out their investigation. They're trying to track down Daniel Hall. They go to the apartment of Lita Hall, and eventually it leads them to investigate the mysterious death of Carla, the friend of Lita who burned to death. Corinthian and Matthew then find themselves at the morgue, and they find Carla's burned body there, and Corinthian, he removes Carla's eyes from her head and he feeds the eyes to his own skull eyeballs. And by doing that, he is able to see what was recorded frozen on the inside of Carla's eyes, moments before her death. In doing so, he sees Carla's confrontation with Loki, and he now knows that Loki killed Carla and is involved in Daniel Hall's disappearance. Lita Hall and the kindly ones working through her travel to Morpheus's dream castle. There, they are talking to the three gatekeepers. The gatekeepers tell her that she must leave, but Lita Hall, just by talking, manages to kill Morpheus's griffin. She says, or the kindly ones rather say through her, Griffin, you are old. Your flesh is meat, and the meat is decaying. Your bones are dry and brittle. Within you now, lion and eagle abandon their battle for dominance and surrender to time and to the grave. The griffin then just starts withering away and dies. The two other gatekeepers are shocked. They are preparing to attack, but Morpheus tells them to stand down and allow Lita Hall in. Lita, she walks through the castle, walks through various rooms, and eventually comes face to face with Morpheus. Morpheus tells Lita Hall to come in, and the kindly ones acting through Lita Hall say, We are not Lita Hall. We are far more than Lita Hall. We are the kindly ones, Morpheus. We are vengeance and hatred and unending. We are your doom. The kindly ones then begin to gloat. We will destroy your dream world, Morpheus. We will destroy everything you have ever loved, anything you have ever cared for, and in the end we shall destroy you. And Lita Hall interjects and says, You killed my son, you pasty-faced bastard, and you're going to suffer for it. The kindly ones then add, You have spilled the blood of your family, Morpheus. You killed your son. That makes you our legitimate prey. And Morpheus replies to them, This is my world, ladies. I control it. I am responsible for it. You will neither destroy it, nor will you destroy me. And the kindly ones to this say, no. Well, how fair is the griffin on your gate, Dream King? Lita Hall and the kindly ones leave for now. They are going to cause more havoc in the dreaming. Corinthian and Matthew report in on their latest findings to Morpheus. Corinthian says, the child is no longer in the waking world, but we will find him. Morpheus is a little bit disappointed in their progress and that they haven't found Daniel yet, but at least there is progress. Elsewhere, we see Lucifer is in the Lux, still playing piano with Mazikeen by his side. Elsewhere, we see Thessaly is reading while Lita Hall is still in her bed in the Dreaming. Elsewhere, we see Nuala, she is sitting in the world of Fairy, 
and she is still sad that she has left Morpheus' dream castle. Elsewhere, Rose Walker is in England, and she writes in her diary about how much she really liked this Jack Holdaway, the man that she betted. And she tries to phone Jack, though, see if he wants to hang out again? But then she finds out on the phone that Jack is married or has a girlfriend or something, and he does not return the feelings for her, and he does not want to see her, and his girlfriend or wife is in the room while he's having this phone call and doesn't really want her to overhear this conversation. So he speaks quickly and rejects her, and Rose is pretty sad and bummed about this. Love just never works out for her. In the dreaming, Morpheus and the members of his staff hold a funeral for the dead griffin. This will be the first funeral of many to come. Issue 65, The Kindly Ones, Part 9 I found it kind of funny how Rose Walker kind of looked like a depressed version of the Wendy's mascot girl here. That's totally her, right? So Rose Walker, she goes to visit Paul McGuire at his estate to take him up on his offer of a tour. So Paul, he leads her through the house and takes her to his library, which I believe has some of Lucian's unpublished books from the Dreaming in it. They then go through various other rooms, and Paul eventually feels out of breath and has to sit down, but he tells Rose to keep wandering, keep looking around if she wants. So Rose, she walks, and she finds a secret stairway, and she follows it downstairs into the basement. And in the secret stairway, she sees Desire is there, waiting for her. Desire is Rose's grandfather. I mistakenly referred to Desire as Rose's father in one of my previous videos, so I'm just correcting that here. Desire is indeed the grandfather. Desire raped Unity Kincaid while she was asleep. Desire, she says hello to Rose by saying, Hello, granddaughter. So you got my message. The two talk a bit. Before Desire can say much more though, Rose kind of goes on a tangent and she discusses love and how it hurts and how she hates it. Rose's feelings are clearly hurt from this Jack Holdaway not returning her feelings for him. Rose, she wonders why she is telling Desire all of this. Eventually though, Paul McGuire comes down into the basement and finds Rose. Rose was sleeping. And he wakes her up, and Desire is gone. But Desire left behind a heart-shaped item down there in its place. Rose is leaning upon the glass chamber that Morpheus was trapped in all those many years when he was down in Roderick Burgess's basement. This was the room Morpheus was a prisoner in. Rose speaking about Desire to Paul says, There was this person down here, and I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, and he, she, kept lighting cigarettes all the time, and she was going to tell me all these secret things, I mean, really important things, and all I had to do was shut up and listen, and instead I just started ranting on about stuff. I was just talking and talking, I never shut up long enough to hear what I was meant to learn. Elsewhere, in the Norse Dark Elf realm of Svartalfheim, Corinthian and Matthew the Raven are trying to find Loki. Matthew has something, though, that seems to be pulling him back to the dreaming. He starts disappearing, but Corinthian tells Matthew to fight it, and Matthew does, and he remains there. He remains by the Corinthian side. Corinthian and Matthew, they manage to find Loki. But Loki is in a disguise and is pretending to be Morpheus. And lying, he tells them both that, Oh, you guys did a good job. This whole thing was a test, and you've proved your worth, and they should return to the Dreaming now for their reward. Corinthian, though, sees through Loki's ruse, and Corinthian and Loki begin to fight. Corinthian is choking Loki, and Loki is warning Corinthian that if Corinthian kills him, then the curse of a god will follow him down the halls of time. So, Corinthian can't fully kill Loki without facing dire consequences. But no matter, really, Corinthian can still torture Loki and keep him alive, but make him pray for death. In the Dreaming, Fiddler's Green is walking around his 
beautiful green lakeside landscape. And Alita Hall and the kindly ones approach him. And they stab Fiddler's Green through his chest with a wooden spear, killing him. Elsewhere in the dreaming, Matthew, against his will, got pulled back into the dreaming, away from Corinthian and Loki's fighting. Matthew got transported all the way to Morpheus' side, and Matthew informs Morpheus about what's been going on, and how Loki is involved and how Corinthian and him are fighting. Matthew asks Morpheus to send him back to Svartalfheim, but Morpheus says it's too late for that. Morpheus, at that moment, senses that Fiddler's Green has been killed. Morpheus says he must go. He has business in the waking world. Morpheus transports himself to Los Angeles, to Thessaly's apartment. Morpheus, talking to Thessaly, says he is here to end the matter of Lita Hall. He must kill her in order to save the dreaming. Thessaly and Morpheus walk over to the bedroom where Lita Hall's mortal body is in the bed but it is still enclosed in the circle on the floor that Thessaly made. Morpheus is not allowed to cross the borders of the circle, or there will be consequences, and Thessaly knows this. She knows it is against the rules for Morpheus to do this. That is why she made the circle. Morpheus tells Thessaly, Someone once told me that we would see each other again. This is in reference to Volume 7, when Morpheus was talking to Destiny, and Destiny told him, She does not love you, and truly she never did. She will not change her mind, no matter how long, nor how deeply you wish that this were the case. You will see her but one more time, long after all this is over, and the outcome of that meeting will not be satisfactory for either of you. So we learn right now that Thessaly was Morpheus's unnamed girlfriend that he had in Volume 7, the one that he loved deeply that dumped him and made him all sad and mopey. Morpheus asks Thessaly, Why have you done this? Why? And Thessaly answers why she brought Lita here and drew the circle. She says, You may think I did this just to hurt you, but not entirely. I made a deal with the kindly ones. I bought a little more life. Maybe a couple thousand years? Every bit helps and they agree to forget some old scores. So, Thessaly, she made some sort of deal with the Kindly Ones for a longer life, and that is why she did this. A little part of it, though, also probably did this to give a little screw you to Morpheus. Morpheus discusses killing Lita Hall, he says. I could kill her. There are many ways to end a human life. I could do it without breaking the circle. And Thessaly says... Without breaking the circle, perhaps, but without breaking the rules? Morpheus says, no, I, I must do it directly. And Thessaly says, your kind are so bound by your idiot rules. Except for your big sister, she does whatever she pleases. She's a cold bitch, that one. Of course, I could break the circle for you. I could even kill her for you. I am bound by no rules, and I owe her nothing. But... We have established that there is nothing you could give me that I want. Morpheus tells her, I didn't intend to hurt you. And Thessaly replies, And what if you did not? Intent and outcome are so rarely coincident. Morpheus continues, I just simply wanted you to know that I didn't want to hurt you. Morpheus, he then leaves, and Thessaly continues to watch over Lita. Back in Spartalfheim, Loki is still alive, but Corinthian has eaten Loki's eyes, and he has finally found Daniel Hall, who is tied to Loki with some sort of string. Issue 66, The Kindly Ones, Part 10 Corinthian severs Daniel's string tying him to Loki, and he is going to return with Daniel to the Dreaming. Before he does, though, Corinthian tells Puck, that he is breathing too loudly. He knows that he is there. Puck reveals himself and he explains that they burned away a lot of Daniel Hall's mortality in the fire. Another few days and they would have fully got it all. So that is perhaps what they were trying to do. Kill Daniel Hall by burning his mortality off in the fire. Because Daniel Hall is somewhat special and powerful and I guess he is 
harder to kill than a typical person. Corinthian asks Puck if they should fight now. Puck just offers to leave and return to Fairy. He says it was a delight to make Corinthian's acquaintance, though. Puck then leaves. Loki, he regains consciousness on the floor, and he asks Corinthian to kill him. Corinthian refuses, though. He is not giving Loki back his eyes, either. Corinthian then leaves with Daniel, leaving Loki there on the floor. Odin and Thor eventually arrive to collect Loki later. Loki tries to lie and make Odin believe that he had been captured by Morpheus to be tortured. Loki, he's trying to start some sort of war between Asgard and the Dreaming. Odin scoffs at such notions, though. He doesn't believe Loki. Thor carries Loki and he is bringing him back to Asgard so he can resume his punishment of getting acid dripped on his face for eternity. Loki tries to goad Thor into killing him by revealing to Thor that he slept with Thor's wife, Sif. Loki in graphic detail tells Thor, Psst, your wife Thor, the lady Sif. She has a birthmark, high on the inside of her thigh, in the shape of an anvil. She let me lick it. She let me do far more than that. She went down on her knees and swore to be my slave. She let me whip her with a whip of oiled leather. She let me explore every crevice of her body. She let me do things she swore blind she had never let you do to her. And when I was sated, she begged me. She pleaded with me to come back to her and do it again. Thor is enraged. He definitely wants to kill Loki, but Odin stops him. Odin tells Thor, Loki only says lies, and the punishment he's going to have in Asgard is much worse than death. Death would be so easy for him. Loki, he is tied up once again, and the snake continues to drip acid on his face down below. Back in the Dreaming, Abel is killed by the Kindly Ones. Two swords right through his chest. Although Abel seems to die all the time at the hands of his brother, it seems a little bit different this time, although he could in theory come back to life. None of them in the Dreaming are truly dead until Morpheus himself is dead. Over in the world of Fairy, Puck has returned. Nuala is feeling a little glum. She no longer wishes to wear her glamour to hide her homely appearance. Queen Titania sees Nuala without her glamour and is insulted. Nuala says that she is more comfortable without her glamour. Clurican, he makes up some lie and covers for his sister and does some sort of spell and adds her glamour back onto her. Clurican then charms Lady Titania and smooths this whole Nuala without her glamour thing over. Puck, he then comes over and grabs Nuala and he wishes to dance with her. As they are dancing, they discuss her time with Morpheus while she was his servant in the Dream Realm. Puck reveals what he's been up to with Loki, how the two of them have set the Kindly Ones off to kill Morpheus, and Morpheus will not be alive much longer. Nuala, concerned, runs off. Elsewhere in the Dreaming, Mervyn Pumpkinhead goes on the offensive. If he leaves everything for Morpheus to do, nothing will get done. Mervyn collects a type of machine gun and he prepares to face off whatever foe comes. Eventually, the Kindly Ones arrive, and he attempts to shoot them, but it is no use. They kill him as well. Elsewhere in the Dreaming, Lucian and Morpheus are aware of Mervyn being killed, and Lucian is angry with Morpheus. How dare he let Mervyn be killed? He was a fine soul and he didn't deserve it. Lucian asks Morpheus, what is he going to do? Is he just going to let them kill everyone in the Dreaming? Morpheus tells Lucian his plan was to kill Lita Hall in the Waking World. That would have put an end to this, but that plan proved impractical. And now he is considering his next steps. The Kindly Ones will not leave until he is destroyed, either by his own hand or by another's. Nuala, running through the Forest of Fairy, comes across Delirium looking for her dog. Nuala asks if it is true that Morpheus is in trouble. Delirium doesn't answer but gives a sad look, so Nuala figures it is true. Nuala asks if there's anything Delirium can do to help her brother. Delirium says she's looking for her dog. 
Nuala asks, well, where did you leave it? And Delirium smiles big. Nuala's a genius. Delirium should look for Barnabas where she last saw the dog. Elsewhere, we see Rose Walker is on a flight back home to the USA. Back over to Nuala. She remembers the amulet that Morpheus gave her and that she can use it to summon him so he can grant her a boon. She uses the amulet and talks to Morpheus. Morpheus discusses with her, but he says that he is extremely busy right now and can this wait? It is not a convenient time for him. Nuala insists, though, that Morpheus come to her. Morpheus, then, not wanting to break his word to Nuala, travels to her and summons in front of her. Nuala asks if Morpheus is indeed in trouble. She's worried about him and thought that summoning him here would help him. Morpheus answers that he supposes he is in trouble. He tells Nuala that as long as he remains in the dreaming, no real harm can occur. Morpheus is powerful in his dreaming. The kindly ones could kill and cause harm to the dreaming, but as long as Morpheus remained there, he could not be destroyed and he could rebuild any damage they did. Nuala replies to Morpheus, though, My lord, you are no longer in the dreaming, as she summoned him here. And Morpheus replies, realizing that he did it in fact leave the dreaming by coming here, and he has now put himself in a bad position. Issue 67, The Kindly Ones, Part 11 Corinthian returns with Daniel to the Dreaming, and he comes to Morpheus' castle, but Morpheus is not back yet. Morpheus and Nuala continue talking. Nuala apologizes to Morpheus for summoning him. She says she thought that she was helping. Morpheus explains his situation to her about the Kindly Ones and how they are pounding him and trying to destroy him. Nuala says that the two of them should just go on the run. But Morpheus says he will return to the Dreaming, and he shall do what he has to do. Nuala apologizes again. Morpheus, before he leaves to go back to his realm, tells Nuala there is still the matter of the boon he granted to her. What does she want? Nuala comes clean with Morpheus, and for her boon, she kind of says she wants Morpheus to love her because she loves him. Morpheus to this says, And do you think that love is a gift like a bauble or a trinket, something I can reach into a pouch and present to you? And Nuala says, I gave all my love to you years ago. Morpheus to this says, Did you? I, I did not realize. Morpheus, he can't give her his love. He says that he could give her a dream of his love, but Nuala, she just kisses him and says that she already has that. She tells Morpheus to go. Rose Walker returns back to America, and she goes to visit Zelda again, who has now died. Rose, she pays all of the bills in the hospice center there and makes the funeral arrangements. When Rose leaves the hospice center where Zelda is staying, we see a homeless man and Delirium's talking dog Barnabas hanging out with him. In the Dreaming, Lucian, Cain, Corinthian, and Daniel all wait in Morpheus's throne room for him to return. They discuss the last time Morpheus went missing when he was taken prisoner. Even the new Corinthian has memories of the old Corinthian and the dark days the last time Morpheus was gone, and the dreaming started deteriorating. Lucian says that Morpheus will be back, though. They have little Daniel Howell with him now, and they look for something for him to play with to keep him busy. In Destiny's Realm, he reads from his book about the coming events and about the reality storm that will come out of it. Morpheus, he finally returns back to his realm after... He was visiting with Nuala. He arrives to his castle and finds Lucian, Cain, Corinthian, and Daniel there. Because Morpheus left the Dreaming to see Nuala, the Kindly Ones have managed to take over, and Morpheus's castle or the Dreaming are no longer a place of refuge for him. They are under the Kindly Ones' control. There is no way he can win now. Cain talks with Morpheus and wants Morpheus to reinstate his brother Abel who got killed. 
Morpheus says that now is not a good time to talk. Morpheus kneels down and says hello to Daniel. It is at that moment the Kindly Ones arrive, and the Kindly Ones tell Morpheus, You are gone from here, Dream King. The castle is ours now, to do with as we will. Shall we free your prisoners to torment you? Shall we shatter your windows that hide your power, your madness? Morpheus angrily tells them to leave. The Kindly Ones have scorpions claw at Morpheus's face, causing him to bleed. It is clear now that the Kindly Ones are in charge. Morpheus tells them, realizing that they made him bleed. You dare? Lita Hall notices that her son Daniel Hall is in fact still alive. Morpheus didn't kill him. Lita Hall talks with the Kindly Ones. Her son is alive. They don't have to do this. They don't have to kill Morpheus. Her son is right there. They have to rescue Daniel. The Kindly Ones do not care, though. They still wish to kill Morpheus. Morpheus and Lucian are alone for now. The Kindly Ones in Lita Hall have temporarily withdrawn. Lucian asks Morpheus, what is he going to do now? Morpheus says he will do what he must. Morpheus orders Lucian to bring Daniel to him. He must discuss matters with him. He also wants an eagle stone emerald that he keeps in a small wooden box. He tells Lucian to bring him that as well. Morpheus, he then puts on his dream mask, and he prepares for whatever is going to come next. Issue 68, The Kindly Ones, Part 12 Morpheus has the green emerald item he asked for, and Daniel Hall has also been brought to him. Matthew the Raven is there as well, talking to Morpheus. Morpheus tells Matthew the Corinthian has sworn to destroy him for deserting him on their mission when they were confronting Loki. Matthew asks, could he kill me, really? And Morpheus answers, not permanently, but for a while. Matthew says it wasn't his fault, though. He didn't ask to be brought back here. Why doesn't Morpheus tell Corinthian that? Morpheus says that he'll tell him. Morpheus is staring at that green emerald, and he's looking at it, and he contemplates it. This particular emerald was the least powerful of the dream stones that Morpheus made. But Morpheus, he studies it and looks at the light, catching the edges, he says. Facets, Matthew. Each facet catches the light in its own way. It glints and sparkles and flashes uniquely. It would almost be possible to believe that the facet was the jewel, not the tiny part of it, but then as we move the jewel, another facet catches the light. Matthew asks, so what's your point? And Morpheus says, my point? I have no point, Matthew, save for the jewel and the facets and the light. We see an aspect of the whole, but the facet is not the jewel. Matthew asks if Morpheus is going to fight the kindly ones, and how come he can't just easily destroy them? Morpheus says he can't destroy them because there are rules, and the rules are part of something far huger and older than just him. Matthew then asks about the kid, Daniel. Morpheus explains that he has already spoken to him. Matthew doesn't really understand. Daniel is just a kid, not exactly a conversationalist. Morpheus, he just reiterates that he has spoken to him already. Matthew asks, so what now? Morpheus, he bids Matthew farewell, and he tells Matthew he will not forget him. Matthew, though, refuses to leave. He says he doesn't want to go. He wishes to stay by Morpheus' side while he faces what comes next. Elsewhere, Rose Walker meets her old roommate, Hal, whom we saw in Volume 2 of The Doll's House. They lived in the same house together. She invites him to Zelda's funeral. Hal, though, he refuses to go. Back to Morpheus and Matthew. They transport to a different area of the Dreaming to confront the Kindly Ones. Matthew tells Morpheus, whatever happens, he wants Morpheus to know that he enjoyed being Morpheus's raven as well as his friend. And Morpheus, kind of a little bit surprised, questions, friend? And Matthew says, yeah, friend, shit, I don't know, whatever. 
Morpheus and Matthew wait for the kindly ones to arrive. And Matthew asks again about what happened to all the other ravens Morpheus used to have. Morpheus never answered him earlier when he asked. While Morpheus answers now, he says, What happens to all the ravens in the end? Different things, Matthew. Some ravens have tired of their existences, and I sent them at their request to my sister's realm, and what happened after is none of your concern. One of them I returned to humanity. It was what he thought he wanted. Two of them have stayed in the dreaming in other roles. Lucian is one of those. He was the first raven of them all. And Matthew to this says, no shit, but he said he didn't remember his early days. And what about me? But before Morpheus can answer, the kindly ones arrive and they announce themselves and say, we are here, dream lord. Elsewhere, Nuala talks to her brother Chloricon and wishes for him to remove the glamour spell from her. She wishes to have her normal appearance again. And Nuala also announces that she wishes to take a journey and leave the world of fairy. Back in the dreaming, Morpheus is talking with the kindly ones. Morpheus tells them, I want you to leave my realm. I want you to stop harming the entities who live here under my protection. The kindly ones respond, We will do what we shall do, eh, dreamer? We will do what we must, and we cannot leave until our task is done. Morpheus asks, And if I fought you and I took a stand here, what then? And the kindly ones answer, Then nothing would change, Dream King. How will you fight us? You cannot even touch us. Take your stand, we care not. We will continue to rip apart your world, bit by bit, shred by shred. Your son's blood is on your hands. Morpheus to this says, So you will not be satisfied with anything less than my death? Elsewhere, we see death arrive at Morpheus's castle. She talks with the Corinthian, who warns her to get away from Daniel. He doesn't want her taking him. She tells Corinthian that she is not here for Daniel. She asks where her brother is, and Lucian tells her that he is with the ladies, madam. Lucian, Corinthian, and Daniel and Death all wait together. Morpheus asks the kindly ones, I have no alternative, do I? And they answer no. Morpheus, accepting his fate, removes his dream mask. And Matthew warns Morpheus, are you crazy? Morpheus, he shrinks down his dream mask and pouch of dream sand, and he tells Matthew to return to the castle with it. His sister Death will be there. Tell her to meet me here. Matthew, he doesn't want to go. But Morpheus tells him, please, do this last task for me. He also tells Matthew to wait for him there. Matthew asks, I don't get to come back? And Morpheus answers, I'm afraid not. Matthew tells Morpheus that he'll wait for him back there in his throne room. Morpheus says bye to him. Both of them somewhat realize they will never see each other again. Morpheus, he throws his cape down to the ground and removes his shirt and other gear. Matthew, he arrives back at the castle, and he tells Death, He said you'd be here. He wants you to go to him. Issue 69, The Kindly Ones, Part 13. This is the final issue in this volume. Morpheus is waiting, and eventually his sister Death arrives, and they sit beside each other. Death comments, you know, that I've been worried about you. Morpheus replies, the last time we had this conversation, you threw a loaf of bread at me. This is in reference to issue 8 in volume 1, when they met at a park and spent the day together. Morpheus, he conjures up a loaf of bread and they talk. Morpheus tells Death, I am tired, my sister. I am very tired. Back in the castle, Corinthian has a Swiss army knife and throws it at Matthew, but Matthew dodges it and it misses him and it kills some sort of spider monster that was apparently an escaped prisoner in Morpheus's prison cells, and it escaped when the kindly ones let all the prisoners out. In the Sandman companion book by High Bender, Neil Gaiman explains that he initially intended for Matthew to die here at this moment and for Corinthian to kill him, and Neil said he was building up to that. It was in his initial script, but his assistant editor named Elisa Quitney, she got very upset about Matthew dying when she read the script, 
Neil theorized maybe it was because she recently had a newborn son, also named Matthew, but it made her upset and she managed to convince Neil to spare Matthew's life. So that is why Matthew lives right now. I thought that was interesting background info to know. So Matthew, Lucian, and Corinthian all discuss the various freed prisoners that are all around Morpheus's castle. Lucian says a few are left in the castle, but he's dealt with a few of the others, and the rest all fled. Matthew asks Corinthian, is he still going to try and kill him now? Corinthian changes his mind. He says, I ought to, but hell, bird, life's too short. Back to Morpheus and death. They discuss the predicament that Morpheus is in. Morpheus explains he did not plan this. He had thought he would have been able to keep the events here in check. He intended to wait the kindly ones out, he says. Had I remained in the dreaming, the kindly ones could have done no damage to me directly, nor have been able to do anything irreparable to the dreaming. No one was hurt I could not have restored. But I was forced to leave the dreaming. Death tells Morpheus, don't you start blaming Nuala for this. You didn't have to leave. You didn't have to do anything. And Morpheus answers, no, you're right, of course. It has nothing to do with Nuala. It has everything to do with me. Since I killed my son, the dreaming has not been the same, or perhaps I was no longer the same. I still have my obligations, but even the freedom of the dreaming can be a cage of a kind, my sister. Death tells Morpheus, destruction, he simply left took his own sigil, said he wasn't responsible for the realm of destruction anymore, and that it was no longer his affair and took off into the forever. You could have done that. And Morpheus to this says, no, I could not. And Death, knowing her brother could never give up his responsibilities, says, no, you couldn't, could you? The kindly ones start causing havoc in the dreaming, ripping the world apart. Finally, Death tells them, enough! I have had quite enough of this. Leave us alone. This is between me and my brother. So the kindly ones leave them alone. And Death asks, Well, what are we going to do with you? Morpheus says, They are destroying the dreaming. What else can we do? I have made all the precautions necessary. And Death says, hm, You've been making them for ages. You just didn't let yourself know that was what you were doing. And Morpheus answers, If you say so. Death tells her brother, Dream, give me your hand. And Morpheus, he touches Death's hand. There is a bright white light, and then the flame extinguishes, and Morpheus is now dead. Elsewhere, Nuala tells Queen Titania she is leaving Fairy. Titania is upset, but she allows Nuala to go. Delirium finds her dog Barnabas finally on the street by the homeless man. They are reunited and Barnabas is happy to see Delirium and says he will never leave her side again. Lucifer in his nightclub, the Lux, is talking to Mazikeen. He says that he opened this nightclub for his own enjoyment to entertain himself, but he thinks he is ready for something new now. He says one more night for the Lux and then he thinks that's it. Then he will travel on anywhere, everywhere. He does not know. Rose Walker and Hal attend Zelda's funeral. Alex Burgess, he wakes up from his eternal waking. He wakes up for real this time. After five years of sleep, with Morpheus gone, he can now awake for real. Lita Hall wakes up as well. She is no longer having a nervous breakdown and no longer in the dreaming and no longer with the kindly ones. She is now in the bedroom with Thessaly. She is confused. She asks if she was drugged or something. How did you get here? She was looking for her son, Daniel. And Thessaly tells her, As I understand it, your actions have ensured that you will never see Daniel again. I'd take a shower and then I'd start running if I were you. Lots of people are going to want to hurt you or kill you for what you've done, including me. In the dreaming, little Daniel Hall changes form and becomes the new Dream of the Endless. The kindly ones return to their home, and they sit, and they eat, and they talk, just like in the beginning of this volume. They have a fortune cookie waiting to eat, and they read the fortune, and it says, 
Flowers gathered in the morning, afternoon they blossom on, still are withered by the evening. You can be me when I'm gone. They comment how they don't like this fortune, and they crumple it up, and the one witch says to the rest, There, for good or bad, it's done. And that is the end of Volume 9. Alright, so that was Volume 9, The Kindly Ones. Let me go through my thoughts on this volume. What I liked, what I didn't like. The artwork I thought was pretty basic and cartoony, like I mentioned in my intro. It's serviceable for the story, but it's not my favorite, and not as beautiful as artwork in past volumes. I did like the overall confrontation in this volume between Lita Hall, the Kindly Ones, and Morpheus. There was deaths, there was huge stakes, and there was huge fallout, so I found all that to be very exciting. I did find it to be a little bit convoluted, though, especially how the Kindly Ones and Lita Hall kind of merge, and Lita Hall traveling through the city streets as well as the world of myth, and the whole thing with Medusa was just kind of uh, too much, a little bit high concept for me, but uh, still, not too bad, and I did like the overall battle we had in the end. Now, with regards to some of the side plots in this volume, uh, one of them was Rose Walker's storyline. I felt she was a little bit forced into the story. She wasn't really needed in this story at all, it seemed. I did not care about her and Zelda and Hal, minor characters from the doll's house. I don't need to revisit them, really. I did like seeing Rose Walker in England, though, and meeting Paul McGuire and Alex Burgess and uh, the mansion that we saw in Volume 1 where Morpheus was trapped in, so it was nice revisiting that. We got to see Rose Walker talk with her grandfather, Desire. That was cool, although I think more could have came out of that whole conversation. So I'm a little bit mixed on Rose's story in this one. Now, Nuala, I thought she had some great moments in this one. We learned that she really loves Morpheus and didn't want to leave the dreaming. And it was a little bit heartbreaking seeing some of their interactions. So that was really good stuff in this volume. Chloricon, when he vomited out his nemesis, I thought that was really. That was some weird stuff, man. Neil writes this crazy stuff sometimes, and sometimes I just don't buy into what's happening, and I don't like it. So I did not love the vomiting out of the nemesis uh, thing going on in this one. Um, Delirium and her dog. Uh, not a very important side plot, but still. I like Delirium. I like Barnabas. And uh, I had a fun time with that one. Uh, Lucifer. I thought it was great to revisit him. See that he has this nightclub, the Lux. Mazikeen is still by his side, he's playing piano, but he's still wondering, what should he do with his life? I like that those angels that are running hell now try to get Lucifer to, to take it back over, and Lucifer is like, nah, been there, done that, get out of here. So uh, that was a really fun time with Lucifer. Loki and Puck, super fun characters. I like that the two tricksters team up together, that was a really good time. And Loki had a really good sort of plot trajectory in this volume. The fact that he wants to kill Morpheus just because he doesn't like being in someone's debt was uh, uh, really fun. And then the way how it ends where uh, Loki is defeated and Odin and Thor are taking him back to Asgard. And Loki, even then, is trying to scheme his way out of it. So, Loki's great, man. Corinthian 2. Fantastic. Love the Corinthian. I like that he's kind of a good guy now but yet you don't really know if you can trust him. Great dynamic with that character. Matthew the Raven had great moments in this volume, wondering what of the fate of the past Ravens. What about his fate? I also liked the exploration of his and Morpheus's friendship. That was great. Thessaly, it was cool that we got to learn that she was the lover uh, in a previous volume of Sandman that really affected Morpheus and seeing her kind of causing a little bit of havoc this volume. So that was good stuff. And the end of this volume, where Morpheus and the Kindly Ones kind of battle, and Death comes, and Morpheus and Death have this great conversation about responsibility and what Morpheus can do now. So I thought that was good stuff. And in the end, we have Daniel Hall going from an infant to becoming the new dream of the Endless. So uh, very exciting stuff. High stakes, big changes. I thought this volume was pretty great. I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. I'll be back in the future with the final volume of the Core Sandman series, Volume 10, The Wake. Mm -hmm.